Okay, so I want to tell you about uh, an academic collaboration with uh, um, six other um, academics. Alessandro Chiesa, who just recently moved to ETH Zurich, Christina Garman from uh, John Hopkins, Matthew Green, Ian Myers, Eran Tromer, and uh, Madar Zvirza. And um, the starting point is that Bitcoin's biggest achievement is that it's a decentralized payment system that works with no regulation and legis legislation, and it still works uh, with integrity, meaning that it keeps track of payments. Um, but for it to compete with uh, centralized systems, such as banks and credit cards, it still needs to confront some issues, and one of them is anonymity. That's the focus of my talk. Anonymity must be improved. And Zero Cash, this academic work, is a suggestion that shows the first decentralized anonymous payment system that's also been implemented, um, again, academic grade code. So let's talk a bit about anonymity in Bitcoin. Um, suppose we move fast forward to a day where everything is in Bitcoin. So salaries are in Bitcoin, shopping is in Bitcoin, and an employee gets uh, his first paycheck from the company. Okay, and what he actually, what everyone sees on the blockchain is something that looks essentially like this. Um, there's the payer pseudo ID that belongs to the company, there's the transaction amount, and there's the payee pseudo ID, okay? And a lot of other stuff. So the employee goes, goes and celebrates uh, his first salary and buys a cup of coffee. Again, another transaction. Now, the point is that in bold font, you see that the pseudo ID is the same one. So you can connect the dots and write the sort of two edges in a graph. The company paid money to the employee who went and spent it on coffee. And of course, you can connect many, many more dots. So just from this, the barista learns the employee's salary, and the CEO learns where his employee likes to drink coffee. And of course, the employee can look back and see what the other employees are getting, and so on and so forth. And this is something that is problematic, again, in a world where we're all using Bitcoin, and that's the only thing we have. So why should we care about anonymity for Bitcoin. You, you might say, well, you know, Bitcoin, I just have a few of it, and I just use it here and there, and no one will notice. But if you really want it to be deployed on a large scale, so you should know that lack of anonymity uh, limits adoption, right? A business that wants to operate only with Bitcoin should now start worrying about how its competitors are going to learn about its customers. Okay, and it has to compare this to this existing situation, let's say with banks and wires and things like that, where, okay, the bank knows everything about you, but you can trust the bank in most cases. Okay, your competitor will not know uh, what goes on. It also limits fungibility. Um, you got a coin, but maybe this coin two transactions back m was stolen. And now um, this may be something that you need to return. So the fungibility is sort of limited. And that's a bad thing. And it limits trust because I have to worry now that you know even if I'm taking all precautions to make sure that my information doesn't get leaked, but maybe um, you know the coffee shop isn't as diligent. Maybe it isn't switching its pseudo IDs every day, and you know now people can learn about me. So anonymity is a problem. So. Because it's a problem, there have been many, many solutions in the past. Uh, the, first, uh, the first one that goes to the very early days of Bitcoin is just replace your pseudo identities often. Um, but this doesn't quite work. It's not that hard to trace things back. And there are a number of works uh, that, that show how you can trace and learn a lot of things. And it's also complicated to maintain, especially for a large business, like if Starbucks wants everyone to, to pay it and it needs to replace its pseudo IDs every day or every hour. That's a big problem. Um, you could use a mix where everyone pays to one address and then it gets redistributed, or there's an even nicer version using uh, multiple signatures, CoinJoin. Um, but the problem is that now you need to trust uh, your co-mixers or maybe to trust even the mix, and it's prone to denial of service attacks. And you still reveal the payment amount. So if I got 5.1132 bitcoins and I try to mix them, if I don't have a lot of people with the exact same amount, I could still be traced when I take out my money from that mix. You could trust a large party, and it does work pretty well. And this is the traditional 
system, right? Everyone could give its money to Coinbase or one of these things, and yeah, it's, it's, as long as that's safe, that's okay. But also we have to keep in mind the empty Gox incident, okay? And also it's not really decentralized. Um, or you could use some previous solutions that use more advanced cryptography, like ZeroCoin and Pinocchio Coin. Um, their problems are scalability, and they don't really um, hide the payment amount. Okay, so I'm going to describe what uh, Zero Cash does in a very, very um, non-technical way. But let's see what we need to do to, to make Bitcoin really anonymous. So we, we need to make sure that no one can easily figure out the very first line where, where all these links. So, and also not the payment amount, which reveals information as well. So we really need to hide the payment amounts, and we need to break the links between the pseudo IDs, right? And if we did those two things, then sort of all that information goes away, and it's going to be much harder to connect dots and learn, which is a good thing. So I want to point out that when you think about it, achieving anonymity is actually very easy. You just encrypt everything or hash it or something like that. The tricky part is to maintain integrity in the payment system in a decentralized way after you encrypt it, right? And basically what we do is, is, is do exactly that. So we hash everything relevant so that someone looking at transactions really just sees a crypto babble. You don't see anything that, that gives you meaningful information. And now the burden goes to uh, really making sure integrity works. So I'm not going to be able to explain how we get this magic done of integrity works. I'll just, I'll mention in a minute a few of the academic works, but there's a, a, a lot that goes into it. But I, I just want to say that something of this sort, this protection of information um, by, by zero knowledge, or sorry, by proofs of knowledge, is already existing in a lot of cryptographic protocols, including Bitcoin. So think about it. What really prevents a Bitcoin theft? Why should some, what prevents me from, from just going to blockchain.info, taking some address and trying to pay myself, right? So this is really what happens. Um, the payer pseudo ID is, is not just some cryptograph, it's not just some random screen, string, it's, it's part of it is a digital signature and it's the public key of a, of a digital signature. Okay, so only the person who knows the other part of the key, the secret key of the digital signature can you know, prove that he knows it. So each transa transaction must be signed by that secret key that corresponds to the, in this case, to the payer pseudo ID. Uh, otherwise, the nodes will not accept it. And only the cone owner knows the secret key. So knowledge of the secret key, knowledge of something, is really what controls the coins. In other words, so, so this is what a full transaction looks like. Again, there's a lot of more information, but for the purposes of this talk. Okay, there's an additional signature that goes hand in hand with the payer's ID, pseudo ID. And a when you see a Bitcoin transaction that's been cleared and verified, the semantics of it read like this. Someone is saying, by the power vested in me, by knowledge of a secret key, I transfer the funds that are associated with the corresponding public key to some new address. So it's the knowledge of some secret information that really controls and prevents theft. Good. So back to uh, zero cash. Once again, we're going to use knowledge of information to prevent theft and to make the system have integrity. So here, the no but we're going to use a lot more knowledge. The knowledge is going to be the pre-image of the encryption or the hash, OK? So we took the whole transaction and we hashed it. But we who you know, generated, we who really own the coin, know all of the pre-image, and we're going to use that. So what maintains zero cash integrity is that each transaction must be accompanied by a short string that is called a zero knowledge proof of knowledge. So it is a proof of knowledge. It proves that I know something, in this case, the pre-image of the hash and a whole bunch of other information. And it is a zero knowledge proof of knowledge. It does not reveal any information but for the truth of the claim that I'm proving. And the semantics of a zero cash transaction are like this. By the power vested in me, by the knowledge of, 
the hash pre-image and the previous transaction amount, I transfer that amount and not more than that amount to some new address, which is again encrypted and I'm not telling you what it is. Whoever I'm paying will know that, okay? So this is a very high level sketch of what goes on. The details are much more intricate and I urge you to go look at the website or the paper and see it. And the anonymity part is preserved because the zero knowledge proof, this extra thing that appears all the way on the right, um, does not give you any more information but for knowing that the proof, that the claim is true. And that's what maintains the anonymity, the zero knowledge aspect of it. So I think I saw this first on, on some talk by Vitalik that, that uh, our stuff is called moon math and I, I really like that. Uh, that, that phrase. So the moon math zero knowledge engine, it's been in development for at least uh, 30 years and more. It starts with uh, the fundamental paper of zero knowledge. It just reminds me, I was asked, you know, what would have happened if I had uh, received uh, Satoshi's paper for a conference and I said I probably would have rejected it. So it's, it's folklore knowledge that the first paper on zero knowledge the, that later on uh, won the Gettle Award and then Goldwasser and Mikali two years ago got the Turing Award for it. It was rejected three times in a row from you know, the most important conferences in theoretical computer science. So it just shows you that uh, you know, it takes time to adopt, to accept uh, really amazing ideas. Anyways, it starts with this notion of zero knowledge and um, the efficiency part of it, the fact that it can actually be implemented now after something like 30, year, 30 years uses a lot of more modern uh, stuff like bilinear pairings over elliptic curves uh, and it's inside a system known as quadratic arithmetic program. It's a theoretical framework that's also been implemented in code for general computation in a system called Pinocchio coin and also by um, others that collaborate with us at the lab that's called Skipper Lab, the succinct computational integrity and privacy research lab and you can go to our website and check out some of the moon math and information about the implementations and so on. So let me just tell you some of the bottom lines on you know, how this thing works in terms of numbers uh, compared to what goes on in Bitcoin. So this uh, proof of knowledge, this magical moon math zero knowledge proof of knowledge um, takes roughly 46 seconds to generate for a transaction on a modern strong computer. Um, it takes uh, six milliseconds or even a little bit less to verify, which is more important um, because that's what you know, various nodes need to do. And it's 288 bytes long. Um, now to generate such a transaction in zero cash, you need a proving key. And the proving key is roughly one gigabyte long. Um, it is generated once by a trusted party before the system is deployed or start and you start using it. And it's one key that everyone should use. The key generation algorithm must use a trap door and this trap door must be destroyed. If this trap door is not destroyed, then a malicious party that knows it can forge transactions. And that's you know, an issue that you should know. Um, so if you don't trust the party that um, distributed the, um, um, this public key, this proving key, then don't use the system. I just want to say that let's now compare the various anonymity solutions. So, um, well, I'll just, you'll see the slides online and I already presented this. I just want to say that there's one thing I didn't talk at all about and that's the PCP based uh, uh, solution that has not been implemented yet and you can see that it's all green there so it's like the best thing that could be but for its efficiency that's why it's not been implemented yet but hopefully it will be someday. Um, so. I, to summarize, because my time is up, Zero Cash is the first implemented decentralized anonymous payment system that hides all three things, payer, payee, and payment amount. Um, its ver verification time and transaction size are comparable to Bitcoin, so you could envision it operating alongside with it or maybe even adopted by Bitcoin. And I just want to end by saying that the strong anonymity provided by zero cash now poses some interesting questions. For instance, it's harder to analyze markets because you don't see anything. But this can be solved because uh, 
you don't need the full anonymity. You could pierce it a little bit and reveal information that you think the markets want to see. Finally, regulation that is very important has been talked about. So again, the moon math is sufficiently general. It's universal. It applies to any computation that is efficient. So whatever regulators decide should be reported, taxed, uh, audited, can theoretically be um, implemented even under the veil of anonymity. Thank you very much.